Thank you very much, Professor Bezemek. Thank you. It's great to be here, uh, even if only virtually. Uh, for me, as an Israeli, uh, uh, planning to present in 2030 is a bit over-optimistic. We have a common birthday wish that says that you will get to next year. So for me, planning to 2030 is uh, highly optimistic. But uh, anyway, I will try to give my best predictions as for the state of the rule of law uh, in 2030. And I think that this is quite a challenging task for the mere fact that the rule of law comprises of a number of often conflicting formal, procedural, and substantive aspects. And all these aspects basically concern the way by which a community or the community is governed. Now, the formal aspects that we usually talk about concern the generality, clarity, publicity, stability, and prospectivity of the norms that govern society. The procedural aspects usually concern the processes by which legal norms are created and administrated and the institutions like courts or independent agencies that enforce the law. Uh, and on some accounts, and this is more contentious, the rule of law also comprises of certain substantive ideas like fundamental rights, justice or proportionality that was mentioned earlier. And, and these are more contentious and I'll come back to that later. Uh, you know, the most important demand of the rule of law is that people in positions of authority would exercise their power within a constraining framework of well-established public norms, rather than in an arbitrary ad hoc or purely discretionary uh, manner on the basis of their own personal preferences or ideology. So the rule of law basically insists that the government should operate within a framework of law uh, in everything it does. And, and, and then it should be accountable through law, uh, et cetera. So I wanna, what I wanna do uh, uh, in, in the, the next of the talk is to briefly go over the various aspects and then to show what I think would be the most significant changes of this concept in 2030. And there are some, there are some that I think would be quite dramatic. Uh, so I'll start with the maybe the more uh, procedural account. So the, the procedural account usually deals with, uh, with two things. First, rule by law, the idea of the supremacy of regular as opposed to arbitrary power. This is what maybe Scalia called the rule of law is the law of rules, uh, to put it very formally speaking. Uh, uh, and the second one is the enforcement of law. Uh, 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 what Spiegelman called the rule of law in enforcement. Uh, uh, this is the idea that the law that exists would actually be applied and be applied equally. Uh, and uh, uh, the third aspect of that is the supremacy of, of law, or maybe the subjection to the law. And Henry de Brechton gave uh, an expression to this idea by stating that even the king himself, the king must not be under man, but under God and under the law, because the law makes the king. So everyone are equal before the law. The law is supreme, uh, or as uh, A.V. Dicey puts it, with us, every official from the prime minister down to the uh, uh, collector of taxes is under the same responsibility for every act done without legal justification as any other citizens. So there is clear law, it is uh, supreme and everyone are bound. This is the, the procedural aspect. Um, uh, the formal aspect or what some people call the jurisprudential aspect is more interesting uh, because here we deal with some minimum requirements without which a legal system cannot exist. Uh, and among philosophers uh, uh, and, and Graz staff knows this much better than I am, uh, there is disagreement about what are these minimum requirements. And if uh, anyone wants to elaborate, you can just look at Joseph Ra's The Rule of Law and Its Virtue in the Law Quarterly Review. Uh, but for the sake of, of let's say, simplicity, I'll, I'll focus on Fuller and what Fuller entitles the inner morality of law. Okay, so for Fuller, there's a list of certain conditions that every legal system must comply with. So the first one is the generality of law in the sense that there must be rules. Now, however fair or unfair, as opposed to an ad hoc basis. So we need to have some, uh, the idea of uh, general laws. Uh, promulgation, 
laws should be published in advance so that people would be able to know what is the law that applies upon them. Uh, objection to retroactive legislation. Fuller says that a retroactive law is a monstrosity to speak of governing on directing conduct by rules that will be enacted tomorrow is to talk in blank prose. So we can't guide the people with retroactive legislation. We need the law to be applied prospectively. Uh, the clarity of laws. Laws should be, uh, uh, it's not enough that they will be published. Even Caligula published his laws, but he put them on high pillars. We need the laws to be available for the people and to be uh, clear. Uh, and laws should not contradict each other again, so that the people will be able to know what they're supposed to do. Laws should not require the impossible. Laws should not be changed frequently. And finally, which I'm not sure it's related to that, more to the procedural aspect, there should be a relationship between the declared rule and the official action, the enforcement of the rule. So these, is, these are Fuller's conditions. And obviously we know of legal systems that have retroactive legislation, that law isn't published, frequent changes in law. So I need to be clear about that. What Fuller says is that a total failure in any of these directions does not simply result in a bad system of law, it results in something that is not a legal system. But even Fuller understands that this is an ideal form of uh, 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 utopia. Okay, there, there, there is no legal system where all these rules are perfectly abide by. Okay, this is an utopia of legality, he says. Uh, so what we need to make sure that there isn't any, that there isn't any total failure in any of these requirements. Finally, the substantive aspect. Um, uh, this is much more contentious. There are various approaches to what is the substantive requirement of the rule of law. Uh, what is clear for us, and we know that, that these conditions are not enough, because even if we take Fuller's uh, uh, inner morality of law, uh, uh, this is perfectly compatible with governments of the most repressive uh, and irrational sort that we can imagine. So accordingly, scholars have been trying to suggest some substantive aspects for the rule of law. So Dvorkin suggested recognition of political rights in positive law. Uh, Long Bingham, likewise, said that rule of law is the foundation of a fair and just society with guarantee of responsible government and, and protection of rights. Uh, Aaron Barak suggested a due balance between individual and society. So for Barak, the very idea of proportionality, of balancing is inherent to the rule of law. Uh, and for O'Connell, uh, what is needed is a democratic rule of law that ensures political rights, civil liberties, and mechanisms of accountability, which in turn affirms the political equality of all citizens and constrain potential abuses of state power. But obviously, uh, uh, it's very hard to agree on what exactly is the substantive aspect. So uh, I'm done with the introduction of the concept the way I see it. And now I want to deal with the changes uh, of the rule of law in 2030. The first one that is very much related to the previous talk we heard is the move from substantive notions to purely formal and procedural aspects of the rule of law. Uh, this occurs now in, uh, in, in the democratic discussion, right? We see the move from liberal democracy to illiberal democracy, Orban style, or from Aaron Barak's notion of substantive democracy to formal democracy, uh, a la Israeli conservative right-wing right approach. And likewise, I think, discussions of substantive aspects of the rule of law uh, uh, will be avoided because in the current understanding or public rhetoric, they are regarded as political means by which detached liberal elites and courts impose their own liberal and universal worldview upon the real national people. So I think this would be the first change. And, and this move, substantive notions to purely formal ones, quite reflects, I think, the populist and democratic erosion trend, because one of the characteristics of the populist project is instrumentalism, a frequent change of law and of the constitution itself for instrumental narrow political interests. So the political, uh, uh, the current political approach is, yeah, we can use 
the, the law any way we want. This is extreme majoritarianism, uh, but for them, they say this is the, the rule of law because we changed the law. Uh, so that's the first move that I think is crucial. The second move, and this I think would be the most important move uh, for the rule of law in 2030 is the move from generality to personalized law. Legal norms are usually formulated in an impersonal and abstract manner, right? That is supposed to cover a large number of individual cases. So to legislate means to generalize. I was working for the legal department of the Knesset and we used to draft legislation we think of in an abstract manner. Uh, so for example, consumer does not take into consideration the information of specific individual consumers, but it is based on this model of the average consumer. And negligence law focuses on the reasonable person standard, right? So we have this idea that we're trying to aim to the average or reasonable person. However, the development of novel algorithmic and big data procedures and artificial intelligence as tools of personalized legal design uh, uh, would make legal rules to be tailor-made to single persons and to specific individual and legal relevant situation. Uh, so these trends that we see in data gathering and analysis suggest that we could have well-resourced lawmakers that can technically will be able to link their lawmaking to highly particular, uh, particular individual characteristics. Just think, for example, I don't know, of a changing speed limit law according to the specific weather uh, or road conditions in a given part of the road that is also tailored with pre-accident assessment of a specific driver's capabilities. Uh, so uh, as for example, Adi uh, Leibson and Gidon Pachamowski recently state when it comes to copyright law, big data can facilitate the personalization of copy law uh, by uh, distinguishing between various users. And there is a huge emerging scholarly debate about uh, personalization in various areas of laws. So Omri ben Shachar and Ariel Porat talk about personalizing negligence law. Uh, Christoph Bush talks about uh, uh, consumer law and data privacy law and how they can be personalized. Uh, Philip ha uh, Hacker about uh, personalizing EU private law. Um, uh, Hellinger, and Siboni talk about EU consumer law, uh, and, and there's much more about it, contract law and, and, and others. So what is important in the chapter, I will give various examples, but what's important is that the technological progress makes it possible to manage the increased complexity of society and of various and, and of smart ecosystems and, and social behavior and to tailor law to the needs and preferences of specific individual. Uh, now, the purpose of law is to regulate individual behavior, but not every regulation of behavior is law. So I regulate my kid's behavior, uh, but this doesn't mean that this is law, right? So law is the normative Ultima ratio, as some people say, used by the society by the society to govern itself and to allocate goods according to these general rules. So a vital part of, of this like, concept of law is to design the rules in a general manner. So the generality of law or the undiscriminate, undiscriminatory nature of it, uh, uh, regardless of any personal differences of the legal subject, is a necessary precondition of the rule of law. And this can be found out throughout philosophical thinking. Now, it is not that modern legislators cannot or should not produce new types of law in this form of personal legislation, but uh, we need to be sure what we're doing. Such path-taking uh, uh, lawmaking uh, may ultimately lead to a point where the entire concept of law and accordingly of the rule of law is transformed from a well-established system of general norms to a society that is governed uh, uh, by increasingly 
fine-grained and tailor-made system of personal control uh, uh, of each of any aspect of everyday life. So my own laws and Stephanie's laws and Christopher Bezemek's laws will be completely different, even if we are same citizens in the same country, because the law will be tailor-made for us. Now, there are many arguments in favor of personalized law, and they usually uh, uh, talk about how this improves the legal system adherence to individual freedom and choice, uh, and, and it's more fair. Uh, uh, of course, we need also to be cautious because in its extreme version, what this may lead to is somewhat, I don't know, totalitarian bureaucratic society that controls each uh, individual to uh, uh, technocratic uh, bureaucracy. Uh, I'm not there yet, and I'm not going to elaborate on that. This is not for 2030, to my mind, maybe for the 2040. Uh, so this is the most important move, this uh, personalization. There are two additional minor changes that would accompany this move. The first one is strengthening the publicity requirement. So access to legislation would be fundamentally better online quickly updated and access databases of laws and regulations that would be written in plain language and accompanied by explanatory notes and videos. Uh, I will ask Siri, what is the law that applies now? What do I do? Uh, and so many technological advancements would simply assist us in better accessing and understanding the law of license. So the great advantage of personalized law is also that it would be much better in guiding and informing the individuals about their laws and obligations. So when technology would permit these micro directives, lawmakers would be able to give uh, specific people uh, guidance and instructions concerning the law that applies to them. And finally, it's not only about publicity of law, but it's also about enfor enforcement of the law and abiding the law. The existence of big data uh, regarding what people do I don't know, online street cameras, facial recognition, et cetera. All this would fundamentally transform the procedural aspect of the rule of law by significantly decreasing the cost of enforcement of law. So legislators, if legislators, and I'm almost done, now choose between rules that provide certainty, but are costly to design and are imprecise because they can't really predict all scenarios and standards that generate ex ante uncertainty and are then usually adjudicated ex post. The increasing personalization of law will weaken this trade-off between the two because it would replace the choice between rules and standards to what Casey and Ibled call micro-directing. We, we can take the advantages of both rules and standards into this thing so that future technology can allow us to tailor and communicate micro-directives or micro-laws to, to each individual in real time by using novel, predictive, and communicative means. Um, so uh, uh, I'll just end by saying that there's another important note about this, the law enforcement. Endorsing personalized law means also overcoming technical and, and normative obstacles of, to, to big data uh, that are actually in the hands of private actors. So this would mean that in 2030, I believe, private uh, actors uh, would take a much greater role in the enforcement of personalized law, maybe even in, in its making. So I want to conclude. Personalized legislation may advance public legal awareness, abiding by the law and its enforcement, but while we may advance economic and effectiveness of lawmaking and law enforcement, which we may choose to do, of course, we will also be departing from the very idea of a general law for all people. Thank you very much.